Hey there, Pastor Patton. Ready? Well, good day, good day, good day. Coming <laughs> up on Reformation, good day. And we got three lessons that will challenge us significantly today. So hang on to your chairs and keep your Bible handy because these are these are rich. These are rich. Do you recall last year at this time, uh, we did a live stream Martin Luther on Reformation Day where they... <laughs> You had a bobblehead Martin Luther, and I was dressed up with my own kind of bald head monk outfit. That was that was a blast. Was a blast. I think we lost quite a few uh, listeners and observers, and uh, that day, as I remember, it's true. It's true. Everyone left the church. <laughs> <laughs> but we are looking at a passage from Revelation, a passage from Romans, a passage yeah. from John, and all of them are deep. So let's pray the Holy Spirit's uh, power. Lord God, we give your spirit to use the word, your word as a two-edged sword, as your, uh, your, your means to give us faith, to strengthen our faith, to guide us, to curb our sin, to, to show us our sins, and especially to console us with your good news of salvation in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would use your word today and in the days to come. To, uh, to work your good work in our life. Bless this time of study. We pray all this uh, trusting in you with gratitude in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, first reading, uh, the ordinarily the Old Testament is on this Reformation. And these lessons were chosen not uh, uh, by that... Uh, grand group who chose from all the different denominations uh, our lessons that we would read together each Sunday, but this being Lutheran Reformation Sunday, this is one chosen by the Lutheran Church um, uh, a long time, and, and most uh, Lutheran congregations across the country will read um, probably all three of these lessons, but the first one is not Old Testament, it is from the book of Revelation and has a unique kind of attraction, I guess, and interest for Lutherans and has for a long, long time and is often read either on this uh, weekend uh, or on Reformation Day or around this time because of uh, of its its place in the book of Revelation, but but also for its place for Lutheran Christians, and that's what we'll take a look at. So when you um, are uh, listening to the first lesson this Sunday, you'll say, oh, that's why that's there. Yeah, Revelation chapter 14, chapter 6 through 7. Uh, and let's just read that whole because it is just essentially two verses. Read the two verses and then come back to it again and say, well, why these verses on Reformation Sunday or Reformation, in this case, Reformation actually day? Um, and Marilyn incidentally asked as we were coming home, tell me again why. Uh, Halloween and Reformation have this much in common mm -hmm. and very quickly simply because you will remember that it was on October 31st 1517 that um, a professor from the Wittenberg Seminary um, and one who functioned also often as a pastor in the city of Wittenberg Martin Luther uh, nailed 35 theses, as they were called, or 35 questions, or 35 things, or 95, I'm sorry, just things to think about on the door of the Wittenberg Church um, on the evening of Halloween, <laughs> as we know it in our, in our world, in our society today. Uh, but he nailed these to the door of the Wittenberg Church, the fortress church in the city, so that people might read them or see them or discuss them in the days and weeks to come. And it was essentially 95 challenges to um, the church uh, challenging 
uh, the teachings and the practice of the church as to whether they were consistent with the scriptures and most especially whether they were consistent with the gospel. Um, and the reason he chose to do this is that on all hallowed evening, or that's what we called it in English, but on this uh, evening of the 31st was the day before or the evening before uh, All Saints Day. And so people went to church on that 31st that evening, um, and they would see these 95 challenges or these 95 theses. Um, and uh, many of them, there we are, many of them would be there so that they could read uh, this as they came to church on the evening before All Saints, which was a special evening and a special service. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in English and in other parts of the world, uh, Christians would come or they would observe something called All Hallowed Evening because of the Saints Festival the next day and because it was a time in the uh, uh, geography of Europe that uh, there would be these uh, strange condensations of moisture over tombs and over especially graves in the cemeteries uh, because of the uh, the warmth of the earth, especially those who had been buried recently, the warmth of the earth and the coldness um, of the um, of the atmosphere around, and as the warmth began to move up, uh, so the cold air would catch it and it would condense it, and it would look like there were things coming out of the grave, maybe spirits coming out of the grave. And for all kinds of reasons, whether it was the saints or the condensations or the cemeteries, whatever it might be, it became a time of remembering the dead and remembering the saints, such as is still uh, practiced in, in uh, Roman Catholicism in Mexico. So this is got a special kind of time and reformation uh, and the nailing of the 95 theses and All Saints Day, November 1st, ordinarily the next day, um, all these came together in a strange sort of conflagration of both uh, uh, a strong message to the Holy Church in the um, 95 theses and a strange kind of combination of superstition and anxiety and remembrance of saints and the dead and the living and everything else. All of this comes together, and this is the reading for that day, Reformation Day. Then I saw, verse 6, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And the angel said, cried out with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, what lessons should we read on Reformation Day or, or, or the, that, that day? Well, for Lutherans, it, as they studied the scripture, yeah, this is a pretty easy one. Um, this Revelation chapter 14, then I saw another angel flying directly over with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, and language. Who is that? Well, it's Martin Luther, obviously, because it is his angel who challenged and changed and reformed the church in ways that has nothing happened quite as much before uh, in the church, nor quite as much after. And so, as this lesson was read on um, a Reformation Sunday, Lutheran Christians would come to worship, um, and they would see this reading or hear this reading and then say, of course, this is a promise that God gives to his church that he will send another angel 
flying directly overhead of his people with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. If there has ever been in the history of the Christian church, anyone who has done a better job of bringing this eternal gospel in the midst of a chaotic kind of Christianity is Martin Luther with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Obviously, this is the lesson that we ought to read because to give thanks to God for his servant, Martin Luther, and many other reformers at that point. And then verse 7, and he said with a loud voice, and there again has seldom been a voice that has been louder in the church than that of this professor pastor in the little town of Wittenberg. He said with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come upon his world and upon his church and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water and i love it that the church <laughs> whoever made these decisions as to what lesson we should read on Reformation Sunday or Reformation Day, I think, and I've read this for, that it, this just fits. There may be a, a question about who this third angel is, but there's no question in the minds, I think, of Lutheran Christians how important the Reformation and how important this Martin Luther and how important this Reformation Day, October 31st, is to the church to the world, and to you and I as Lutheran Christians. Pastor Stephen? Yeah, well, I think that was the whole point of Martin Luther's passion, was discovering for himself the gospel message in Scripture as he taught it as a Bible professor and finally getting access to the, the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and being able to see there that there is a, a salvation that is ours by grace through faith. And uh, he was just sure that if he could get this gospel out, uh, even in his lifetime, surely Jesus would come again <laughs> because the, the, the joy was so great in his own life to know that he was forgiven and that heaven was open to him. He really um, sacrificed much and his whole family did katie included i talked about that last week or the week before um but they sacrificed so much to just be able to get the gospel message more accurately understood and celebrated in the life of the church and so we also remember um, any number of things we'll we'll probably see examples of luther's seal uh, in church on Sunday, uh, and we will also uh, have a chance to remember, if we don't hear it again, those three great solas of the church, alone, 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 and this was one of the great graces that Luther again gave to the church as his, as his angel um, uh, flew over history, and that is sola Gratia, that is, we are saved by grace alone. Sola fides, we are saved by faith and trust in God alone. Sola scriptura, we are saved by the grace and the trust that God gives us in his holy scriptures, sola scriptura. And finally, we summarize all three of these in one mighty sola, one mighty alone. Sola Christus. Sola by Christ alone, by Christ alone. So it's a day to remember, uh, by God's grace, who we are, what God has called us to be, as we are a, a bridge into the world as Lutheran Christians who focus on the good news of God's love in Christ and the cross and the resurrection, which saves us now and forever, and which is our burden and our blessing to share. Well, if, you, if you had your Martin Luther bobblehead there, I'm sure he'd be nodding his head. <laughs> yes, and, and matter of fact, I do. I never go far 
never yeah. go far without the bobblehead. But you see, he's got the scripture right there. Just got through pounding the 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just set, set him here so we don't forget it. Yeah. Right. Second lesson. This is going to take somewhere between seven and eight hours to get through. It is <laughs> without question one of the most important and one of the most difficult readings and writings of St. Paul that we have in all of Holy Scriptures and is so powerful and so beautiful. And uh, we're not going to be able to do justice to it in this short period of time, but we are going to hear some of the biggest, most powerful, and deepest words in all of Holy Scripture translated into English out of the Greek, uh, words like righteousness and what that means, what it means to be righteous. Well, some people say that means, well, he's a pretty good guy. He's a righteous one. And the scriptures say, no, that means that he or she is sinless. And they could not hardly be further apart in the way we ordinarily would use them and the way they come to us as St. Paul writes, writes now. We've also got the word redeem or redemption. Here we've got the word sacrifice. We've got the word justice and justification. These deep, deep words of Holy Scripture, which in a short period of time we'll try to do justice to, or at least open the door. So again, in your conversations and your reading of the Scriptures and your reading of Christian theology and your Bible study groups, you can take these up once again and rejoice digging all the way down, for these are deep and they are rich, and they in so many ways symbolize Romans, not only because of what they say as well, but how they say it, central, central to St. Paul's letter to the Romans, and central to us as Christians. I think uh, so, so let's just go Romans chapter 3. You said sacrifice, but really you wanted the fancy word, right? Propitiation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's not so. I, I misspelled let's it. See, let's see. You got propitiation. <laughs> there you are. There we are. There we are. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's let's go through it and see if we can do just to it in a relatively short period of time, but as you've written these words down, we could look them up in the dictionary, which I did in the Greek this morning, okay? So I can give you hilasterion in place of redemption, or I can, I can give alatriosis. As in, anyway, let's go on with the list. Verse 19, St. Paul writes in the first chapters of Romans to get this as foundation and grounding for everything else that he is going to write to this church in Rome and to these Romans who are trying to find their way into the depth of God's love and to experience, to experience the beauty of his forgiveness and the promise of life forever. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says, speaks to those who are under the law. In this case, law means essentially the law, the codicils, the behaviors that the Old Testament gives us and doesn't merely suggest, but says, this is the way you must live. This is what obedience means. As God says, I give you these laws and I give you this covenant and I will keep my part of the covenant and you keep your part, right? Obedience. And so that's the way St. Paul introduces, if you will, this word of the law and God's demand, okay? And his utter righteousness in demanding it. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, which are God's Old Testament people and also those of us who embrace and hold fast to ourselves the Old Testament, so that every mouth may be stopped. Wait a minute. Every mouth may be stopped. The law stops us 
from excuses. The law stops us from explanations. The law stops us from any kind of self-justification or self-righteousness. The law stops it. And then in that way, every last man, woman, and child, the whole world may be held accountable to God as he demands and appropriately demands from us as our creator, our redeemer, our savior, as he demands from us that we live up to and live of giving the righteousness that he has called us to in the law, that the whole world may be held accountable to God's promise, to God's covenant, and to obedience to him. But then he stops. For by works of the law, St. Paul says, no human being will ever be declared righteous in God's sight. No human being will ever be acquitted no human being will ever be able to say, I am not guilty. For the law holds all of us to account. The law holds all of us to rightness. The law holds all of us to sinlessness. The law holds all of us to the law that God gives us, that he fulfills and expects to be fulfilled. No human being will be able to say, I am righteous or I am sinless in his sight. Since through this law, if we really hear it, if we really understand it, if we really read it, if we really take it seriously, if we recognize this law that the eternal creator who created us gives to us, through this law, we understand that we are unrighteous, that we are sinners, that we live under condemnation, and that the limited and little obedience which we give is simply nothing, nothing, nothing. Or as in another place in Isaiah and again in Paul, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we recognize this in the law, for through the law, we are condemned because of our sinfulness. Verse 21. But now, now the righteousness, the righteousness of God has been shown apart from the law. What, what, what God says in this, in this word of St. Paul, what God is saying is, you are acquitted. Okay? You, I'm going to hold you guilty. And that's the way the word righteousness often comes across, that God gives us this rightness or this righteousness. It seems to me, and I'd like to have you hold on to this and think about it, uh, and that is because now it is not simply God saying you are acquitted. This righteousness that God gives us is a righteousness of his embrace. He is our father. He doesn't say, I'm not going to hold you guilty. He takes us, wraps his arms around us, and promises, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and you now have my righteousness, not simply my forgiveness, but my love and all the gifts that I would give you. And you are my child, and I'm going to hold you in my life and in my love and in my eternity forever. So this righteousness is not simply a pronouncement. It is an experience. It is an experience in life now the righteousness of God, the embrace of God. And often I will use the word, and you may think about it, that righteousness means primarily a relationship. Righteousness is God 
holding us, God embracing us, God loving us. So I would even prefer if we could do that, but now a relationship with God has been shown apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it in all of the Old Testament, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I will never leave you nor forsake you three times in the Old Testament. The law and the prophets bear witness to it. Verse 22. And this is the righteousness. The righteousness or the brand new relationship we have with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through trusting, through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is in, in an, not an, I was going to say an oversimplification. It's not an oversimplification. It is simply so, so, so real. God says, I love you. Trust me. I forgive you. Trust me. I will never leave you nor forsake me. Trust me. That's what faith or trust in Jesus Christ is for all who believe. And this new relationship that we have with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is given to us, is given to us with the word, I love you. I forgive you. You are mine. Trust me. And then Paul goes on, for there is no distinction. Hear this, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us by our sin are separated from God, separated from everything that he would give us and be for us. And we have all fallen short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift. Okay, we are declared God's own because of his love for us, and he gives it as a gift, not something we've earned, not something that we grow up to be better than we were, but it is at the moment that we say, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, friend and comfort, Holy Spirit, I love you, and I want to serve you all of my life. And it's a gift. It's a gift. Now, these come these two words. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Go back, if you would, for just a little bit to this word justified or justice. Justice means that when I am found guilty, I must pay the price. When I am found guilty... I must be imprisoned. When I am found guilty, I am shut off from friendship, from life, from love, for everything that counts. Uh, we are justified by his grace. Okay? We are declared now not guilty. Why? Because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There are so many, so many dimensions to what God has done and is doing for us to this day in his cross. And we could well spend all of that time, all of that time, maybe just even seeing the hymn in the cross of Christ, I glory. But where there is injustice, the price must be paid. Where we sin, we must pay the price. And this redemption says that God in his son, Jesus Christ, has paid for our sins, has redeemed us from death, has redeemed us from Satan, has redeemed us from sin, so that we are declared just because our sins are placed upon God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what redemption is. Someone has entered in and taken our punishment and paid the price for our injustices, has paid the price 
that we would have had to pay because we are unjust, because we are guilty, because we have disobeyed, because we have thrown our humanity out the window, out the door, because we have trampled on our promises that we've made to life and to the world and family and friends and nation and even creation. And God in his son, Jesus Christ, has redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil in the cross of his son, Jesus Christ, because there is justice, and that justice is paid by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified, declared God's own, by his grace as a gift through the life, death, the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God himself, verse 25, whom God our Father has put forward as a propitiation. That word again, it, it, we very seldom, I don't know if I've ever used even that word outside of the context of Holy Scripture, Pastor Stephen, but what propitiation is, it's a sacrifice. It is a giving up of myself. It is a giving up, and, and, and for because of what I what I uh, must pay, okay, what I must give in return, but whom God put forward as a sacrifice by His blood, in His cross, in His life, in His giving, in His teaching, in His loving, and providing for us, in His blood fed finally on the cross as a sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. And there is in these verses uh, uh, a, 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 a grand exchange, I guess you could say, that is beyond our imagining. And the grand exchange is that I offer to God my sins and he gives to me his son. I offer to God my disobedience, and he gives to me the obedience, the righteousness of his son. And so there is this, this grand exchange which St. Paul is expressing to us in these deep words, in this deep concept, which finally, again, can best be expressed as I sing, in the cross of Christ I glory. And that is a way of summarizing so much of what is being said here. And yet, by the way that St. Paul takes it verse by verse and word by word and offers it to us, it gives a depth and a deeper, a deeper and higher meaning to what God has done for us in his love in his son, Jesus Christ, and what now in exchange he gives us his grace, but he also gives us his Holy Spirit, although that is not mentioned here, but it certainly is in the chapters to come. And finally, then, the last part of verse 24, or verse 25, this, all of this, the cross, his grace, his forgiveness, his embrace of us, this is all to show God's righteousness. This is what righteousness looks like. This is what righteousness, and if we would live up to the promises and the possibilities that God gives us through his spirit, then we begin to touch or to taste or even exhibit in our little life the righteousness of God, the goodness, the grace, the justice, the mercy, everything that God is for us, we, we hint at maybe in our lives. Is that the best way to say it? I never quite get it right enough to say I am righteous, except that I am forgiven by God in Christ, and his righteousness covers me. And so I am, in spite of who I am, I am the righteous daughter. I am the righteous son. I am the authentic human that God is in the process of creating through his son's death and resurrection, and through that death and resurrection as it comes to life and to fruition in me, in me. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance over the centuries, he has passed over, not that he had forgotten, 
but he had passed over our former sins as they accumulated, I guess you could say, as they rose higher and higher until, verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at this present time, his goodness, his grace. There are two words in the Old Testament. We're going to get into them once again in just a, for a few minutes in the uh, third lesson or the gospel lesson for the day, and that is two words. God's righteousness is his grace and his truth. Those two always, all the way from, and you can read that at your leisure too, as Moses asks to see God's glory and God speaks to him as he puts Moses in that place in the rock, in the um, <clears throat> Uh, built on the rock, or 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 uh, um, um, uh, ah, all of a sudden the, the hymn is the hymn is escaping me. Um, uh, anyway, uh, it was to show God's righteousness at this present time, so that He might be just, as He says to us, "You are forgiven, your sins have been paid for, and you are the and He is the justifier of the one." who has faith in Jesus. So we are declared not guilty, but beyond that, we are embraced by the eternal God. This is not just forensic. This is not just words. This is relationship. God's grace, as he comes to us, gives us his righteousness and embraces us with his life and with his love. Verse 27 then. Then what becomes of our boasting? Well, that's pretty much already said. Then what becomes of our boasting? Is he looking to uh, those Jews who think that they are so good because they are following the Old Testament law? No, he knows better. Is it uh, because of us who uh, are not Jews and how well we've done uh, in navigating our lives and, uh, and, and following or doing? Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. All we have is Gratitude, gratitude, trust, life, love in the name of Jesus. It is excluded. All that is left is my thanksgiving, my eternal gratitude to God for what he has done for me and his son, Jesus Christ. All I have is a continuing and growing trust for him and trust in him who has kept perfectly his covenant with me in his son jesus christ so the boasting is excluded it doesn't belong and christianity has no place in the church or anything that i think i have accomplished or we have accomplished by what kind of law by a law of works no but by the law of faith for i simply trust i trust not because of what i am what does the hymn say Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. For we hold, and this is the last of it, for we hold that one is justified. That is, one is forgiven, one is held guilt-free because of what God in Christ has done for us. So we hold that we are justified, forgiven by faith, by faith, by simply trusting in his promises. I love you. Do you trust me? I do. I forgive you. Do you trust me? I do. I will be with you forever. Do you trust me? I do. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. And this is the most appropriate kind of reading for a Reformation day or a Reformation Sunday, because it says in heavy, deep theology, big words, deep and rich, it says precisely what God in Christ has done for us and what he is doing for us and what happens to the old Adam or the old Eve as we are now breathed into by his Holy Spirit and begin this new life in him 
For we hold that we are forgiven by trusting in his promise, trusting in his forgiveness, trusting in his grace, having nothing whatsoever to do with our accomplishments, which are puny and pitiful, but our new life in Christ, apart from the works of the law. Well, and 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 again, that's so much, but but there, it's just both difficult to express and explain, but also a lifetime in growing up and learning on this Reformation Day epistle, Stephen. Well, a really important note. All of it is so important. One what it really uh, has been helpful to me is that in verse twenty six, where it refers to. Uh, well, why did it have? Why did salvation have to come in this way? The Word become flesh, Jesus being incarnate, Jesus doing what He did, Jesus being uh, hung on a cross and and killed. Why did it have to be this way? And uh, that phrase, so that God would be just and the justifier. You know, God loves us. We're broken. We're fallen. He cares about the evil that we commit. He cares that we're hurt by other people's evil. He cares that we hurt other people. And so uh, we want a God who is just, but it's also terrifying to think of the prospects of a God who is just, who will repay, uh, who will pay for the guilt. And uh, we want it to be paid for <laughs> when terrible things happen. Um, there's evil in this world. And so we we're encouraged that God is just, but he, the good news, and, and it's because of his love and his faithfulness, his commitment to us being part of his eternity, that he would justify. So he would do the work to make us right in the equation of justice. I think we disrespect things and people who are unjust, who aren't consistent, who uh, are just living as hypocrites or like giving the good stuff to those who will pay top dollar. That's a lot of leaders in the world work that way. They don't uh, think fairly or even compassionately about things. It's all about the dollar or the power and um, God is love. And he's also committed to um, justice. And so where evil exists, therefore, there must be consequence. We hear about death being the, the wages of sin. Um, so all, all of what Jesus did, all that he, who he was, uh, was necessary that the problem would be dealt with in the flesh as, as human. It's a human problem, evil. Human evil is a human problem. Um, but God wouldn't just discard us. And so he put himself into the equation. So Jesus became flesh. And as human, he fulfilled human justice, God's expectations of humanity. And uh, we're thankful for that. And we're astonished by that. Uh, but that he would die and that as we're in him, right? we hear about that in Romans uh, 6, as far as being joined to Christ in a death like his in our baptism. But therefore, that payment, that justification is truly placed upon us. And so um, God is just, and he is the one who justifies. And so Jesus's death was necessary, and that was, uh, and sufficient, so that we can know that we are, our sins are paid for. Because how much goodness does, how much righteousness does Jesus put into the equation of justice? He's the one who was the, the word who was with God, who was God, through whom all things were made, right? John chapter one, an eternity of righteousness, an eternity of goodness. And um, that's applied to the problem of human sin and, um, and punishment so that we can know that our sins also are co covered as we're in him. So um, it great, gave great comfort to to Martin Luther, right, who uh, was continually convicted of his own sin, um, so much that he would confess his sins or, you know, at great length, and then he'd leave, and he'd turn right back around and go back into uh, to visit with his confessor and uh, confess more, because he thought of more. We can know that, uh, that we're covered, we're baptized, we're in Christ. When we receive the Lord's Supper, Christ is, is joining with us, and he's bringing that forgiveness that he's earned. So we, we can rejoice, we can have peace. <laughs> and I think we can, uh, as we're talking about this 
this month especially we can have some rest from just that urgency concerning heaven and hell and we can know that well heaven is ours in jesus and so we can focus in on the needs of others not just our own uh, struggles our own needs we can hopefully <laughs> by the spirit love one another in a you know refreshing kind of way not a scared got to do it or i'm going to get smacked kind of way we can just be at peace and love one another yeah and i think as as as, as we finish up that verse where it's it so where what happens to our boasting <laughs> when i was in my i guess my fifth year of studies uh, at the sim, I had the greatest roommate. He was just, when we, we still uh, are close to today, 60 years later of our graduation. Anyway, whatever it was that was just just piling up on me, um, I sat down. It's Paul, I said, I need to visit. With you. I think I'm going to um, uh, leave the sim and look for another vocation. And he just looked at me, slack jawed, and said, What are you talking about? And I said, I'm just not good enough to be a pastor. And he and I was right. <laughs> there was no question. And what do you say? What do you mean? I said, I, 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 I just am not good enough to be a pastor. And of course, I looked at what the pastors I knew and the other, and and I was exactly right. I was not good enough to be a pastor. But Paul said to me then words that uh, are fresh today <laughs> as the day he said that God doesn't call you to be a pastor because you're good. He calls you to be a pastor because you're forgiven. So what happens to boasting? It is excluded. <laughs> you boast in Christ. <laughs> like, oh. it, and that, that really was, I, I did not realize that was piling up inside of me, but, but, it was it was a brand new moment of understanding God's forgiveness. Not about being a pastor, but a, but a moment of understanding the depth of God's forgiveness. Well, and that, yeah, and that applies not just to you know serving as a pastor, but in in every way. I, uh, people who are whether it's serving in the church or just going about your life, serving in your workplace in your particular vocation, to know that uh, you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> The holy work. You know, one of the one of the points that Martin Luther wrote was that you know the mother, you know, caring for her newborn child is doing God's work. Um, it's not just what's done in in monasteries and you know prayer and services, but it's all the things that you do in your everyday life. You're doing the Lord's work, and so you can go about that with uh, with joy, knowing that. <laughs> uh, we're, we're always boasting in, in Christ's accomplishment. And so uh, we're, we're free to serve and to care for others in all the unique ways that, that we are. Yeah, well, we could, we could go on quite profitably uh, and, and we will return, God willing, year after year to that epistle lesson. And year after year, we'll discover new things, I think, in it. And also remember the things that by God's grace, we learn from that. We are justified by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, there it is, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, the Holy Gospel. This is short, but it is in many respects at least as complex, Pastor Stephen, or complicated <laughs> <laughs> as was that second lesson that we just finished in the epistle. So let's read the whole thing in this gospel and recognize once again that this is the third lesson that uh, we read for Reformation Day and that um, um, some of the greatest stuff ever written on this chapter is written by, yeah, Dr. Martin Luther. Verse 31 of chapter eight, uh, and, and and chapter eight is so filled from beginning to end. The end is, I am, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the bread of life. 
I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. So in this eighth chapter, uh, right in the middle of it, there is this, this moment of confrontation and comfort, both uh, as uh, Jesus carries on these conversations with the, um, uh, the, the, the Jewish unbelievers, if you will, um, and those Jews who are coming to know him and love him and saying, I want to follow you. Chapter 8, beginning of the 31st verse. So Jesus said to the Jews who had trusted him, who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm always, a, a, how, would you, how would you say it, a high proponent of the New International Version uh, translation of the Holy Scriptures, and it translates this, verse 31, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, and that is a place where the NIV fails miserably. Where, fails miserably. Now, it says, if you hold to my teaching. Well, first of all, that little word, if you abide, is one of the most famous words in all of the Gospel of John. It's a little four-letter word. And it gets translated in so many ways. And I think we've done this before, as you put it on the screen. It's M-E-N-O, okay? M-E-N-O. That's the Greek word. And the, that little Greek word gets translated a lot of different ways in the New Testament. Um, uh, and here in it, it gets translated as abide, uh, or in the NIV, it gets translated if you hold. And these are not bad translations, but it seems to me that the simplest translation in this case is the best translation. And the word meno means to live in, okay? Not just to exist, but it means Marilyn, I, Marilyn, I love the home that God has given us, and the house that he's given us, and that's where we live and live out of, but there is a, a deeper, a deeper sense of where we live, and that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. We live in him, and we come alive in him, and so I would translate this just, if you live. And then again, in my word, if you live in my word. And uh, I suppose we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but the first chapter, if you'll remember, of John's gospel, and the word became flesh, <laughs> and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. If you live in me, okay, if you live in me, that, that word may be accommodated by all sorts of other things. The more, the more, the closer we get, the more, the more we live in him, uh, the more we read the scriptures, the more we live in him, the more we express his love as he has called us to do. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself if you live in my word. And this little word, live, is used again and again and again, over 50 times in John's gospel, that little word, M-E-N-O. And here we are again. If you live in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And what is one of the great gifts of living as a disciple, living in him and following, not simply in his footsteps, but in his word and in his love, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is that truth that we learned just a few minutes ago in Paul's letter to the Romans. The truth is 
you are forgiven, set free. The truth is you are held close to the eternal God, set free. The truth is you are not a slave to yourself. You are not a slave to the world around you. You are not a slave to anything in Jesus Christ. You are free. And this is such an interesting kind of, uh, uh, how, how do you say, in, 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 a, a different or in, in a distinctive word for our time in our nation, it seems to me, as we try to determine what it means to really be free. Does it mean free of responsibility? Does it mean free to, to, to pick and choose what I'd like to do? Does freedom mean it's all about me? Does freedom mean it's simply self-centeredness, uh, is, is selfishness? Uh, what does it mean to be free, that I don't have to take anybody or anything else into consideration? St. Paul is really helpful here, as in the fifth chapter of, the Galat of Galatians, he says, in the in the fifth chapter stand fast in the freedom with which christ has made you free and do not again become a slave to anything else to yourself do not become a slave to legalisms or law do not become a slave to the kinds of undisciplined freedom that make you a slave to your own interests, to your own human appetites, to your own self-centeredness. Uh, but you will know the truth. And the truth is this, that you are loved with an eternal love, and that eternal love that you are given is what is living in you, expected from you, and will set you free. Not a question of what do I want, it is this, the question of where is Christ leading me and with what kind of grace or strength or peace or power is he setting me free? You will come to know the truth, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, full of grace and truth. And it is though all the way back again from the 36th chapter of of, of uh, uh, the book of Exodus, where, where again, Moses said, I want you to tell me, I want you to show me who you are. And God gives him two words. I am steadfast love, and I am truth. And these two words, this context of, of love and truth for well, we don't need to spend a lot of time here, but truth is following Jesus Christ. Truth is listening only to him. Truth is um, uh, 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 knowing and living in his truth, and in his truth is my freedom. Well, the Jews were also standing there, uh, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are, verse 33, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Well, first of all, they were living uh, in a high-placed, high-powered disillusion because they were enslaved again and again and again, whether it was the Assyrians or whether it was the Egyptians or whether it was the Babylonians or whether it was the Syrians. The nations around them enslaved them constantly. And of course, they have, were for 400 plus years slaves, slaves in Egypt. Uh, and so the fact that they had never been enslaved was, on the face of it, untrue. But they had the idea that even though uh, they may have been enslaved or become a captive people for a period of time, yet they were never really, really enslaved because their minds were free. There's an old, beautiful German song, Die Gedanken sind frei, as long as my my mind is free. You can never enslave me. And that's the way they understood themselves. And it was kind of high and heroic, even though 
I say historically, that was not true, uh, but that's the way they understood. Abraham is our father, a descendant, and he was freed by God. Therefore, we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you possibly say, Jesus, that you will become free? And Jesus said simply, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, you understand that you are separate, commit sin. This comes out of our separation from God. Any time that you are in this state of separation, any time that you commit one of those acts, or those moments of disobedience, every time you uh, turn to yourself and your own needs, your own minnows, your own homes, you become a slave, a slave. And then he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The slave has no stake in that house where he serves. He has no lasting place. For finally, the master of the house can say, okay, you're on your way. Get out of here. I don't owe you anything, and you have no property. You have nothing here. So the slave does not remain in the house. You are slaves of sin. And in this context, only the son remains forever. And I am the son of the eternal God. I am the son of the father. I belong forever. The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is the only lasting freedom our cosmos, our world, our eternity, our history has ever known or will ever know. There is this freedom and I am the Son. Now listen to me. I am the Son. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. No. No, I am a slave to my guilt. I'm a slave to my fear. I am a slave to my anxiety. I am a slave to the world around me. I am a slave to my job. I am a slave to everything that inhibits me or keeps me from experiencing anything remotely from, from, from being free, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I am not free. And Jesus says, so if the sun sets you free, and now suddenly, suddenly, and thankfully, we're back at the cross. So if the Son sets you free from your sins, if the Son takes away your despondency, your despair, your fear, because you are forgiven, and you are a son or a daughter of God, I have the power, I have the authority in time and eternity to forgive and to set you free. And if I set you free, I am the son of the father. It's so interesting, and I've mentioned this a couple of times recently because I came across it as I was studying the book of John, from which, of course, this uh, little Ref Reformation text is taken, and that is that God, that Jesus, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he calls God Father 147 times. I, I, I counted them, okay? He uses the word Father 147 times. Uh, and so he understands that he is the one whom the Father has sent, the Father of all grace and light, the Father of eternity, the Father of everlasting planets, and the Father of your little house, your little house where you live in the Word. So if the Son sets you free, then you will be free. Indeed, well, that's a whole lot. You will be free now. You will be forever. You will be free tomorrow. And you will have these moments where you feel enslaved, inhibited, where you feel like you are unimportant. And uh, uh, you feel for all kinds of reasons that you don't amount to anything. Or if you do amount to something, nobody notices. And there is this freedom from boasting, this freedom from trying to 
help everybody else understand how important I am. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's the last song I heard yesterday as I was <coughs> on my bicycle. I could sing along with that. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Well, and I noticed that that word minnow again uh, comes back here. The slave does not minnow in the house forever. The yeah, yeah. Minnows forever. So like really, if you're not living in 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 his word and being his disciple you're you're a slave it's kind of that that uh, bracketing of minnow that i see here in this whole section <clears throat> abide in the house forever as a son Well, and the gospel lesson is as brief and I think as accessible in many respects as the second lesson, the epistle lesson, is difficult and long and, and you really need to process and process and process some, in some respects, every time you come to it, we've got to start kind of all over scratch. I know what it means. I know what it says, but I, was, I, want, I just want to squeeze every word of that <laughs> and I want to, I want to put it into my soul and into my life so I never forget it. That's where we're blessed because we have the Holy Scriptures and we are free in Christ. Well, and you know, thank you for this study and for walking us through the text. The Reformation Day isn't uh, merely a celebration of, of, of history, but it really is a, a refocusing in on what was the focus of the Reformation it was the, was Jesus Christ and the power of his his death and resurrection and the depth of his promises that really set us free uh, that we, uh, we we don't want to end up a religion that would just enslave in new ways but we want to truly be the, the beloved eternal free people of God and and so we hope that more and more people will come to that to be able to hear that gospel message and keep an eye out for the third angel <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you howard lord be with you pastor stevens joy to be with you again oh and me with you god bless you everyone